Hello and welcome to FRSC 1141. My name is Adam Roberts and I will be your instructor for this class. If you need to get in contact with me, you can call me in the office at 706-357-0162 or you can email me at aroberts at athenstech.edu. Now even though this is not a live lecture, you can get in touch with me by the email or phone, or you can look in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra and we can do a chat session through my virtual office hours, which are posted in the calendar within the course. Okay, so we will be using Jones and Bartlett text, Hazardous Material Awareness and Operations, second edition. Now I know there's a new third edition out, but go ahead and use the second edition for this course. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So let's run through our objectives first, and they're a little lengthy, but that's okay. Define a hazardous material. Define weapons of mass destruction. Identify the location of the emergency response plan and or standard operating procedures. Describe the different levels of hazardous material training from awareness, operations, tech, and specialist, and incident commander. Understand the difference between the standard and federal regulations that govern hazardous material response activities. Explain the difference between hazardous material incidences and other emergencies. Explain the need for a planned response to a hazardous material incident. Define a hazardous material. Define weapons of mass destruction. Describe the different levels of hazardous material training, awareness, operation, technician, specialist, and incident commander. Understand the differences between the standards and federal regulations that govern hazardous material response activities. Explain the difference between hazardous material incidences and other emergencies. Explain the need for a planned response to a hazardous material incident. So when we're talking about responders in this text, the three main categories that we're referring to here are, of course, firefighters, law enforcement personnel, and emergency medical service personnel. And a hazardous material incident can occur at any of the following types of incidents, whether it be a structure fire, an EMS call, an automobile accident, maybe a confined space rescue, water rescue, or acts of terrorism. When a hazardous material is involved, we need to take a step back and understand exactly what's going on because this changes the nature of the incident. And as a first responder, that kind of goes against our grain. We are people that love to jump in, act, and do. We are very type A personalities, and sitting on the sideline for a minute and thinking about things uh, kind of goes against our grain. But in order to handle a hazardous material incident, we do need to take a step back, figure out exactly what's going on, what the hazard is, and make sure we got the appropriate equipment to keep ourselves from becoming a victim. So this changes our mentality. Now the goal of this text in our class are as follows. We want you to be able to recognize hazardous material in WMD incidences, and that stands for weapons of mass destruction. Take initial appropriate action at scene. Implement the incident command system. Use basic reference sources to figure out, of course, what's going on. And of course, have a good idea of the personal protective clothing that you will need to instant enter a hazardous material incident. Be able to implement some sort of product control measures to help contain or mitigate the situation. And of course, perform proper decontamination because if someone is in the hazardous material zone, they are now contaminated and you don't want that contamination getting out to the rest of the public and to you. And you need to understand your role in the hazardous material and WMD responses.
Now, this textbook is an excellent guide. However, it is up to the AHJ, or authority having jurisdiction, that sets your operational policies and procedures in your jurisdiction. So don't supersede what your, your, your boss or community says just by saying, okay, well, I learned how to do this in my class. Now, throughout this text, there are three major organizations that set recommendations and regulations when dealing with hazardous material incident, and they'll reference these standards throughout the text. So if you want to dive deeper into the standard and get more information and background, feel free to look up these references. So the first entity that we're going to look at here is OSHA, which is Occupational Safety and Healthy Administration. EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and NFPA, the National Fire Protection Agency. All three of these organizations write standards to deal with hazardous material incidences as well as other things. And those standards should be used as a great baseline or a guide when operating on or in or near a hazardous material incident. Every responder should know their emergency response plan or basically their standard operating procedure. And again, that depends on your jurisdiction, but we're gonna go through some general guidelines to act or what to do during an emergency scene. But again, we don't want you to overstep the bounds of what your jurisdiction says you can and cannot do. And of course, I want everybody to understand that a standing operating procedure is a set of guidelines that are set forth that outline your responsibilities and tasks needed to do during, for this class, a hazardous material incident. So what is a hazardous material? And that is a substance or material capable of possessing unreasonable risk to human health, safety, or the environment when transported, used incorrectly, are not properly contained or stored. So with this definition in mind, I pose a question to you. If a truck, a tanker truck filled with a thousand gallons of milk, spill and begin flowing into a creek, is that considered a hazardous material? Well, for those of you that said yes, that is correct. Because when we look at our definition, even though that's not a health risk to human health or safety, maybe unless you slip on it, or I guess if you try to drink too much, but that is definitely a risk to the environment because that could kill all fish and other wildlife and plants. So yes, that would be a hazardous material incident. So when you look at a hazardous material, it can include such things as pretty obvious your hazardous substance, like certain chemicals, gases, uh, acids, things of that nature. Other hazards can be waste, not only human waste, but say nuclear active waste or waste from a chemical manufacturing process. Such things as marine pollutants and elevated temperature materials like say maybe hot tar or, or something of that nature. Weapons of mass destruction represent criminal use of hazardous material. And this is basically included in this area it can be your illicit laboratory such as your meth labs, environmental crimes and industrial sabotage to name a few. And later on in this text, we'll go through each one of these uh, a little more in depth. So where can hazardous materials be found? And the answer in short is they can be found anywhere. They could be pure chemicals and mixtures that are used to create millions of other products. It could be other things such as chemical abstract services that produces large database on chemical uh, information. And 83 million substances are registered in the US. So basically any of your consumer products out there can be a hazardous material. And these are just reference points where you can find them. And 
when you're looking at a hazardous material that's being transported, there should be a uh, SDS or safety data sheet uh, that basically outlines what the hazard is and the treatments for it. But again, that's a, another lecture for another time. So just know that pretty much hazardous materials are everywhere and they can be found anywhere in our day-to-day -day life. If you look close around your office or your place of work, I'm sure you can find things that are considered a hazardous material. Hazardous waste is what remains after the material has been processed and is no longer pure in nature. It can be just as dangerous as the pure chemicals and it can comprise mixture of several chemicals. So when you're dealing with hazardous waste, it's really touchy because you don't know exactly what you're dealing with because when you mix different compounds, even though they're waste compounds, they can join together to form something totally new and totally hazardous. Now regulations are issued and enforced by governing bodies. However, these standards from these organizations can be something that's voluntary, meaning they may or may not abide by them in your jurisdiction. So here are some standards to reference, and one is NFPA 472, which is a standard for competencies of responders to hazardous material and WMD incidences. And competencies basically mean what you should be able to do. NFPA 473 is a standard for competencies for your EMS personnel responding to your uh, hazardous material and WMD incidences. 473, which actually has just been updated, uh, has mission-specific competencies, and that's in reference to your advanced life support responding responders assigned to the hazardous material team and to provide clinical interventions at your hazardous material instances, and ALS responder assigned to treatment of smoke inhalation victims. So it kind of outlines what you can do on the EMS side of things, or should be able to do, I should say, during a hazardous material incident. Now, when you're looking at your training levels, uh, OSHA and NPA have similar training levels uh, to a point. However, HAZWOPR is more of the civilian side of things under um, EPA and OSHA standards. And that can be found in CFR 29-1910.120. And their training levels, of course, are awareness, operations, technician, specialist, and incident commander. When you're looking at the NFPA standard, you also have the same levels of training. And that NFPA standard is 472. Now, as I said, there are different levels of hazardous material uh, responder training competencies. You have the awareness level personnel, and in this course of their normal duties, they could encounter emergencies involving hazardous material, WMD. The awareness level personnel are no longer considered uh, responders, per se. And the main focus of the awareness level, of course, is to identify that there is a hazard present. Types of people that are traditionally awareness level personnel are your public works employees and maybe fixed site security personnel. So as an awareness level personnel on scene, you are expected to be able to detect the presence of a hazardous material, identify the substance, use the ERG, uh, the emergency response guidebook, which we have a whole chapter on getting to use that, 
and be able to initiate and implement protective actions, basically quarantine off the area, and be able to know who to notify and when. On the civilian Haswhopper type size, they expect you to have knowledge of the substance and risk, potential incident outcomes, recognize the presence of a hazardous material, and identify the hazardous substance, your role in an emergency response plan, and determine the need for additional resources and notifying a communication center. So you see the Haswhopper on the civilian side is very similar to the has material awareness level on the first responder side as dictated by NFPA. Now the operations level responders are tasked to respond to your hazardous material instances for the purpose of implementing or doing supporting actions to protect nearby person, environment, or property from the effects of the release. And we'll go over the companies here in the next couple of slides. With the operations level responders, they may be trained in a mission specific competency. And what they mean by that is, um, like say, air monitoring. That is a specific competency in the hazardous material scheme. So you may be trained to just a, a certain uh, focus, if you will, of the overall scope. So when you're looking at some of our core competencies, we have, and these are all separated according to NFPA, but they are determine the scope of the emergency at the scene, be able to survey the scene, collect information, predict likely behavior of the hazardous material. Also establish the potential harm, plan response, perform decontamination, observe evidence and evaluate the response effectiveness. Now the mission specific competencies are not mandatory. Uh, so you could basically only know a little section or one or two of these or possibly all of them. It, it just depends on your agency and what they require. Now the operation level responders work under and are guided by hazmat technicians or allied professionals and your hazmat tech is the top of the pendulum so to speak or the pyramid in terms of training so where operations mainly focus on containing the hazard Technicians focus on stopping the hazard and m mitigating it or minimizing it, basically uh, making it no longer a hazard. And of course, the awareness level are individuals that identify that there is a hazard. Now, there are eight of the nine mission specific competencies that are covered in this text for the operations level. And those are using the personal protective equipment performing technical decon, performing mass decon, preserving evidence and sampling, as well as product control, victim rescue and recovery, responding to illicit laboratory instances, and air monitoring and sampling. And again, we'll go over each one of these competencies in detail, but for now, we're just giving you an overview on what's going to be covered. So those were all the operation requ requirements under NFPA. So let's look at the OSHA HAZWOPER operation level responders and what they do. Again, OSHA traditionally is more for your industrial settings and personnel, your non-responder types, where uh, the other is your you know, first responders. So their tasks are should be able to contain a hazardous material or release and protect nearby persons or property. Their competencies include hazard and risk assessment techniques, being able to use PPE, that's personal protective equipment, 
and be able to understand various hazardous material terms. They also should be able to control, contaminate, and confinement knowledge. They should be familiar with the decontamination process and should have standard operating procedures and termination processes when dealing with a hazardous material incident. So now NFPA 472 in the technician level. Again, NFPA mainly deals with your first responders and OSHA deals with your non-first responders or your industrial personnel. So according to NFPA 472, a technician level person responder to a hazardous material incident using risk-based response process. So it's kind of governed by that, which means risk a little to save a little, risk a lot to save a lot. And, that, and that's a good way to sum it up. So the hazardous material tech should be able to analyze the problem, select the proper decontamination process, and control the release of the product. Traditionally, your tech level personnel may supervise the operational level responders. And according to OSHA HazWhopper, Hazardous material technicians are personnel who approach the point of release and plug, patch, or take other steps to mitigate the emergency. And that really is, in a nutshell, what the technician level does on both sides. But I think the Hazwopper does a little bit better job of spelling out exactly what they're going to do. So Hazwoppers, they need to be able to implement their employer's emergency response plan classify and identify a variety, or excuse me, a verify a variety of materials, function in the incident command system in a given role, be able to select and use the appropriate personal protective equipment, and use hazard risk assessment techniques. They also should be able to have advanced control and containment procedures, understand the decon process, understand the termination process, basically saying, okay, yep, this is how we're gearing down to end things, and understand chemical and toxicological terminology and behavior. The specialist level of hazardous material technician receives more specialized training than a hazardous material technician, and that's uh, only identified in your HAZWOPPER um, standard where NFPA and first responder caps out at technician and of course not the specialist. So now let's look at an incident commander for a hazardous material incident. The definition it is responsible for all incident activities and the ordering and release of resources. The HAZWOPPER regulations for your incident commanders are as follows. Know and implement the employer's incident command system. Know how to implement the employer's emergency response plan. Know and understand the hazard risk of chemical protective clothing know how to implement local emergency response plans, know emergency response plans for state, federal regulation response teams, know and understand the importance of the decontamination process, and they require a certain amount of annual refresher training. And this can be yearly or bi-yearly, whatever the, the AHJ requires. So now let's look at some other government agencies that play a role with hazardous material. First being DOT, the Department of Transportation. And they promulgate and publish laws and regulations governing the transport of goods by highways, rails, pipeline, air, and even um, certain cases marine transportation. E 
EPA has the uh, Superfund Amendment and Reauthorization Act of 1986. And what that did was it created methods and standards practice for local communities to understand the chemical hazards in the community. Basically, if you are a business and you have some sort of toxic substance, the community needs to know about it. And that's basically referred to in Title III of the Emergency Planning and Continuity Right to Know Act, abbreviated as EPCRA. Another agency, you may have local emergency planning committees that are put together by uh, your local cities or governments, and basically they gather and disseminate information about the hazardous material to the public. It's usually composed of volunteers from the industries within the community, transportation entities, media, fire, police, and general public representatives. And what they do is they look at the SDS or the safety data sheets, and then they disseminate that information out. Now, your safety data sheets used to be called MSDS or material safety data sheets, but it was recently changed to SDS per globally, uh, so it'll has a globally harmonized system of classifications and labeling of, of chemicals. Uh, basically, it's so that we're all speaking the same terminology in language. You may also have state emergency response commissions, and they act as a liaison between the local and state levels of authority. Uh, it's composed of fire and police services as well as elected officials. And again, they collect and disseminate information related to the hazardous material emergencies. So we mentioned a safety data sheet. So let's look at those briefly. Again, we'll go more in depth with these. So this is a great picture of a SDS and it contains important information uh, such as detailed profiles of the chemical mixture as well as safety actions, toxicology, data, your properties of the chemical, uh, who manufactured it, who supplied it, who to call at the factory if something happens, where the, uh, the specialists are, so they could say, okay, uh, you have a thousand gallons of XYZ chemical, this is what it's going to do, this is what you need to do to mitigate it, and if anybody's exposed, well, you know, they need to have this done to them. So your SDSs are a great source of information. So now let's look at the differences between a hazardous material incident and other types of emergencies. Now firefighters and first responders should not approach a hazardous material incident with the same mindset used in traditional structural firefighting. Usually, and certainly when lives are not at stake, the response to hazardous material incidents emergencies take more time than it would take to fight a structure fire or maybe a service search warrant or things of that nature. Now here's a caveat. If when we're looking at the situation, rescue is required, or the situation is imminently dangerous, some events may move more quickly. The environment and material involved will dictate your response and your tactics used. Now, when you're looking at law enforcement, whether you're law enforcement or not, you need to be aware that they have their own set of uh, responsibilities or focuses in terms of the incident, such as evidence or evidentiary issues, and um, that may help facilitation of later efforts at criminal capture and prosecution. Uh, so, you know, this is 
quite possibly a crime and we need to be aware that hey law enforcement needs to be able to focus on what happened who did what and possibly collect evidence but again that's a whole other chapter for another day this is just a brief overview and you'll kind of find in this text they they like to hit things kind of over and over again so pre-planning response begins with your initial training continue education and your pre-plan activities so what they're basically saying here is, you know, if there's an incident, you need to be able to plan on who's going to do what, how things are going to happen, and who's going to be kind of in charge. And once you get that done, you'll need to be able to practice and update your plan and even update your training as techniques and things change. So your pre-planning activity should take place at your target hazard. What is a target hazard? A target hazard is something within your community that you see as a oh shoot moment. You know, if this local factory had a leak, uh, you're going to be saying oh shoot or some other colorful adjectives and uh, people need to know what to do. And of course, you should be able to discuss and share the information with um, law enforcement personnel as well as your local agencies that are going to be responding to the incident. Now, fire departments, police agencies, and your public health offices and other government agencies have the opportunity to work together in cases of large-scale emergencies. So it's important that everybody knows who's going to do what at these types of incidences. And of course, practice, 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 and plan. Okay, so we covered a lot in this first chapter. Again, this is kind of just a general overview. So let's kind of summarize some key points. Government entities such as OSHA and the EPA issue and enforce regulations concerning hazardous material emergencies. The consensus space and EPA standard relating to hazardous material instances are available for those agencies that choose to adopt them. Remember, NFPA writes standards or recommendations. They do not have the force of law unless they are adopted by the government or government agencies, I should say. A hazardous material is any substance or material that is capable of possessing an unreasonable risk to human health, safety, or the environment when transported in commerce, used incorrectly, or not properly contained or stored. The actions taken at hazardous material instances are largely dictated by what chemicals are involved and the way they behave during the release. Two NFPA standards are implemented to responders who may be called upon to respond to your hazardous material instances. Those two standards are NFPA 472 and 473. It would behoove you to know the difference. Uh, they like throwing out test questions on what standard does what. The OSHA HAZWOPER regulation is found in the CFR Title 29 Standard 1910.120. The EPA version of OSHA HAZWOPER can be found in the CFR Title 40 Protection of the Environment Part 3111 Work Protection. The goals associated with the competencies of the awareness level personnel are to basically recognize a potential hazardous material emergency, to isolate the area, and to call for assistance. Awareness level personnel take protection action only. NFPA 472 expands the scope of an operational level responder to duties by making a distinction between the core competencies and the mission specific competencies. For those who choose to adopt the NFPA 472 standard, the core competencies are required for all operational level responders. Each agency can then pick and choose to require any or all of the mission specific responsibilities, like air monitoring, for example. The core competencies of operational level responders are defensive actions in nature. The mission specific responsibilities of your operation level responders include personal protective equipment, technical and mass decon, evidence preservation, 
product control, basic air monitoring, victim rescue, and incidents occurring at illicit laboratories. And operational level responders assigned to perform improvised WMD dispersal devices, dismemberment, disruption, and operations at improvised explosive laboratories. Finally, hazardous material technicians will approach the point of release so as to plug, patch, or otherwise mitigate a hazardous material emergency. The hazardous material incident commander is responsible for all incident activities. Okay gang, so we covered a fair amount in chapter one, so make sure you go ahead and do the review questions that are assigned with this chapter. And I'll do a little hint, 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 cough, cough, cough. You may see those test questions again some or all on your unit exams. So if you guys have any questions, again, you can call me in the office at 706-357-0162 or you can email me at aroberts at athenstech.edu. Until next time, be safe and have a wonderful day.